Tar, which is the lying of a male, which a woman knows, according to the book of uh, Numbers. A woman who is a virgin is Isha Yodat Mishkal Zahar. A woman who knows Mishkal Zahar. So in other words, Mishkal Zahar is what a woman experiences in intercourse. I, what is that? Penetration. Mishkav Isha is what a man experiences in intercourse, which is engulfment. What's the word? Engulfment in Portuguese? Is there a word? Uh, engulfment. I don't know. Anna. Anna upstairs is helping them. Anyway, so uh, the verse then reads. No, no, it was so good, yeah, was, uh, like, what, what do you mean? Like, like a, well, penetration <laughs> is is the opposite of engulfment. Oh, okay. Yeah, but it's not. Uh, no, no, but it's not. No, penetrad is this, a woman experiences her body penetrated. A man experiences his body, his body engulfed. Okay, that was it. Okay. Got it? So, and with a male, you shall not experience engulfment. Right? It's an abomination. So now we know it's, it's that experience, meaning it's sex, because we might not have known it, because the word lie down means lie in English, in, 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 in Hebrew. It means to lie down too. It also can mean to have sex. So this is really clear. This says there's no sexual union. And why does it have it as plural? Mishkimeisha, the lyings, plural, of a woman. So um, I don't know if you knew that this was going to be an X-rated uh, Torah study class. But there are two ways a woman may be lain with. And can you offer them? You're, you're embarrassed? This is Brazil. What happened? <laughs> Vaginally or anally. Now, you should know that when I'm in college campuses, they're a little confused uh, because there's something that they feel might be missing, but uh, in this case, Clinton was right. He did not have sex with that woman. <laughs> because oral sex is not, is not a, an imaginative frame for the Hebrew Bible's understanding of sex. Oral sex is not sex. You can go and make whatever sense you want to make of that, but it is not considered <laughs> sex. Anal sex is, which by the way, from this text, permits anal sex between husbands and wives. This text permits it. So you shall not, now why does, it, you, why does it need to use the plural? Because how does a man have sex with another man like he has with a woman? A man has no vagina. So the answer is you have to actually make clear the plural ways that a man may, you know, have, pe have penetration in order to understand it's anal sex that's being discussed. So the text then clearly, with this careful reading, says you shall not uh, have engulfment of your sexual organ into the anus of an, a, partner, a partner, it's an abomination. This is a prohibition of what the rabbis call Mishkav Zahar, but what we call anal sex in contemporary language. And it is the fundamental prohibition and everything else is actually not articulated. In other words, here's the thing that jumped out of the text for me. This is not a prohibition against homosexuality or gay love. It is a specific problem with anal sex, and I wanted to know why. Why does the Torah care, does the Hebrew Bible care that men have anal sex? What's the problem? with anal sex. And so that is my question. I want to understand the rationale for the prohibition, the reason. Now, just an aside about reasons. Um, we're going to do four reasons given in the religious material, in the rabbinic uh, material, um, about why the, the Bible should prohibit sex between men, anal intercourse between men. But I want to ask a specific question 
about the reasons before we go on. Because in my world, um, people legitimately claim that a law is a law whether you, whether you understand its reasons or you don't. That's the whole point of law. And therefore, good reasons or bad reasons, it's the law. And so I want to ask a deep question around law and reasons. Do you feel that reasons, but I mean reasons, rationales for law, do they support or undermine law? Do they strengthen law or do they weaken law? What is your thinking? They should strengthen law. How? How do they strengthen law? Making people agree with the law. Right, so if people understand it, they'll be more willing, you think, to do it. Yes. Correct? Okay, but how many parents are in the room? Raise your hand. Yes. yes. What is the best answer to Abba, Ima, why? Because I said so. <laughs> and, and why is because I said Why? You see, now, now we know. I have a three and a half year old. I know. But Abba, why do I have to go to bed now? I know the answer is because Abba says so. Because why is because I said so the better answer sometimes? It's the easy one. What? It's the easy one. Well, it, it, you, don't have, you don't have to argue. Correct. In other words, if I give a reason, the authority leaves me and goes into the reason. If I hold on to, because Abba says so, the lawgiver holds on to authority. That is why code books never give reasons. Law codes never give reasons because the authority has to remain in the, in the law, not in the reason. So I want to say it both ways. As a Jew, of course, the best answer to a question is yes, both, right? Reasons both support law and undermine law. Because if, if you never give a reason as a good parent, your kids begin to feel that you're doing everything you do because of your interests. Good reasons for parents are a way to say, I love you. Because they say, this is why I wanted you to do this. Because I love you and I want you to get good rest and you have to go to sleep. And in other words, Reasons support the motive of love of the lawgiver. No reasons support the power of the law of the lawgiver. And neither one really, I mean a parent who always gives reasons, oy va voy, and a parent who never gives them, oy va voy. Right? So I want to say to you that in the Talmud there's a debate on this. And there's a debate you can understand where you might fall and where the Jewish communities might fall, but it's a legitimate debate. Darshin and Tamad we employ an exploration of reasons to understand how to manage law. Or Lav Darshin and Tamad no, the law is managed without reasons. And so I want to say that there's both positions inside the Talmud, and I understand them both. And I am choosing, as the Rambam, you should know, Maimonides was largely in favor of Darshin and Tanah Dekra. We interpret the law for its reasons. Right? We do. And so that is what I'm going to do here. In other words, I am taking a somewhat, it's in tension with my own community's sense that the law is the law and don't ask. Because I, I think there's another ethic inside the same Talmud that demands it, and Maimonides is, a, is in favor of it more than the other. So I want to understand what's the reason for the prohibition of anal sex between men. That's what we're going to do. Any, any questions as we move forward? Anyone who was confused? Or? in Leviticus is uh, sex that's not reproductive 
that doesn't produce or can that couldn't produce a child is not permitted. And of course, sex between men is almost, you know, it's clear it's not reproductive sexual relations. So, so the reason that this doesn't work is a good rationale. That's one of them. There are many others. Because both the Hebrew Bible, but certainly rabbinic literature, supports sex that is not reproductive as well, specifically between a man and a woman. But a man can have sex with his post-menopausal wife. So congratulations, those of you who are of my age. And, you know, a man can have sex with a pregnant wife, a man can, a, 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 you know, a man or woman can have sex if one of them is sterile. There is no necessity that every sex act be reproductive. But this argument does appear. It appears in a text, actually, interestingly enough, uh, I, I, I jumped over it, but I want to uh, give you a sense of what it is because it, uh, it's relevant to the discussion. There is a medieval um, uh, writer, uh, rabbi, uh, um, who wrote, uh, his, his name was Rabbi Yehuda HaChassid. And he wrote that the reason for the prohibition is in order to ensure that men and women have sex that's reproductive in order to, to uh, ensure the life of the species. So this argument is actually given by lots of people. Um, it's not a very Jewish argument. It's a more Catholic argument in its nature. I don't want to spend too much time on it, but there is something about it that is very important. Because when the mama hears for the first time her son says, Ima, I'm gay, the first thing she says, she thinks is, will he have an all right life, will he be safe? The second thing she thinks is, will I have grandchildren? So there's a very deep, Jewish sensibility around family that makes homosexuality very challenging culturally and religiously too. Because while Jesus makes disciples, Abraham and Sarah make babies. That that is how we, we push uh, the ideas of the Brit, of the covenant, into the world. We push them into the world with babies. And so not being part of the reproductive chain it feels like you've been excluded from the cultural foundation of, of the Jewish people. And I think many gay people have suffered for the desire to want to be a part of a community that so defines membership in being a parent and having kids and raising them to be the next generation of Jews. And what do you do when A, you're single, or B, you're gay, and your sex does not produce a child? So I think the reproductive frame is extremely important to still think about. Um, gay people don't often talk about this in our communities. It's increasingly, there's more, I mean, there's something in America called the gay baby boom. The gay baby boom. Lots of gay couples are having kids in various different ways, as I and my partner have. Um, so that is changing. But I think that I, for years, because you know, I met my partner and we've been together for 15 years, almost 15 years, and Amali is three and a half, I spent many years thinking it was impossible and suffer because I, I, I wanted to be part of this story. So I think that the reproduction is a significant piece. It's simply not a very good reason to prohibit the love of two men or two women. It just doesn't, it's not sufficient. But it is a significant question to unpack. I want to give one text here that's really, I think, a powerful one. Um, 
based upon a text from Genesis after the flood. It talks about um, uh, the image of God and, and reproduction. And so two of his friends, uh, ben Azai, who was a student of Rabbi Akiva, two of Ben Azai's friends say to him, hey, what's the punishment for not having babies, for not being a parent, producing children? And each of them say, oh, you either destroy the human community or you destroy God's presence in the world. And Ben Azai says both. You do both. To not have children is a rejection both of God and of humanity. And then they say to him, but Ben Azai, you never had children. It's a great thing to learn, but you don't do it. And his answer at the bottom, if you look, is, Ma e'ese, what shall I do? Oh, it's the next There it is. Ma e'ese, what shall I do? Libi chashka, a Torah, my heart. My heart lusts for Torah. And perhaps the world will be sustained by others. What he's saying is, uh, I don't know if he's saying that I, my heart lusts for women, for men. He's not saying he's gay. He's saying he has no sexual desire for women. And so therefore, it is wrong to marry a woman without desire. Because this, the commandment to, be, to have children, is predicated upon the relationship that's real. I have to desire the woman I'm with, and if I do not, I cannot marry her merely as a, as a tool for me to produce children. When I was in Israel, slowly coming out of the closet, in 1996, I started a gay men's study group. And there were four young men who were studying with me who were yeshiva bochers. Uh, students who studied in the Jewish Academy in Yeshiva. And they were all fooling around with guys all the time, planning to get married in a year or two because they had to. And I said to them, will you, will you be honest with the women you date that you're not so attracted to uh, women? No, it'll work out. And if it doesn't, I'll divorce. After three kids, of course. And I thought, how unspeakably irresponsible was this? But I understood that the culture had given them no real option. Every path to adulthood, responsibility, and membership was get married and have kids. And so they were willing to, to take, you know, somebody's daughter, somebody's sister, or whatever, pretend to be capable fully of loving her, use her for production of a family, and if it didn't work, they could fool around on the side, and we're going to hear more about that in the Talmud. And so it seemed to me that then as I was saying, there's something wrong about the commandment to reproduce if it is done as without the context of love. And that's why he says, my son, what, what do you want me to do? Now, what do you want me to do? What shall I do? Is not something a rabbi should be saying if there's a commandment. It's a commandment to keep the Sabbath. But what shall I do? I love playing golf. I mean, you know, tell me the rabbi doesn't say such things. What can I do is there are other human demands upon me that I cannot avoid. I can't fulfill the commandment of making babies because you, I would have to abuse a woman to do so. So I think what, what we're discovering is, is that the challenge of this question of, of reproduction is really rich and interesting. It does not, it's not sufficient for obligating gay men to marry or gay women to marry heterosexually to produce children. It's surely that would be a destructive path, right? The only other path. I mean, when I was when I was uh, 18 and 20, rabbis said, "Just get married; it'll all work out." They really did tell us that. Just get married; it'll all work out. And once came out to a rabbi. In, 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 in it was the first time I come out to one of my teachers. 
1998. On Shavuos night, it's coming up, he was making fun of gay people, and I said, Rabbi, maybe it's easy to make fun of gay people because you've never met one who says, I'm your student. Let me be the first. I'm your student, and I am gay. And he said, Stevie, have you gotten help? And I said, let me go home, get help, and I'll come back. Can I date your daughter? Silence. Right. Because nobody wants to threaten their own children with somebody else trying to overcome who they are in this cultural thing. So I want to leave reproduction, but it is a very rich uh, frame for understanding the challenges Jews face, and it is why um, a lot of gay people uh, in all the communities find religious communities focused on families so difficult because avenues for making family are not so simple. Okay. Social confusion. This argument, this reason, is among the I think, most um, uh, fun to, un to unpack because the story is so interesting. Um, I don't uh, I don't think we have the time to tell the whole story, so I'm going to paraphrase. It's a wedding. The man who wrote the Mishnah, which is the foundation book of the Talmud, right? Rabbi Judah the Prince. Yudanasi, Judah the Prince. His son is getting married, and there's a man named Bar Kapara who wants to come to the wedding, and he's a clown, and he always makes fun, and he makes... The, the head rabbi laugh, and no one likes that. The family doesn't like it. They try not to invite him. He gets invited anyway, and he comes and he begins to make jokes at the wedding, sex jokes at the wedding. <coughs> now, you know, you think, like, you know, this is an interesting text. Where is it from? It's from the Talmud. So the first joke, he, he uses words from the Hebrew Bible around sexual relations that were funny language even for the rabbis for their time. And he says, To'eva, the word abomination that we read earlier, To'eva mahi, what is To'eva? What is abomination? What does the word To'eva really mean? And why is it relation, it has any relationship to homosexual sex? And the answer he gives is, uh, let me see if it's the next one, because I can't, Portuguese, but maybe, no, no, it's this, 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 this one, the at the bottom. Oh, is that, it? Yeah. Yeah, the bottom. Oh, there it is, right. So, his answer is, To'e'a ta'ba, which is a, um, a pun. To'e'va, to'e'a ta'ba, which means you uh, wander because of it. You wander because of it. And so, he's playing a little game, but the game is this. Where is this happening? It's happening probably in the city of Sepphoris, where Rabbi Judah the Prince wrote at least some of the Mishnah, where there are Romans, Greco-Romans, and there are you know, Neo-Christians, and there are all kinds of cultures mixing in the year 180 or so, right? And he is, is, is trying to figure out the, the, you know, the, the, the meaning of the word Toeva in a context where there are brothels. Or they're Roman brothels. And so, married men are fooling around with women and men on the side, and who is he making fun of? The men who marry and then fool around with boys from the brothel on the side. You wander away from your wife's bed to fool around on the side. Why are these men getting married? Because I told you. Men get married because they have to produce a family, because without it, they have no economic or cultural reality. Alone people in the ancient world were very vulnerable in many ways, economically, physically, and socially. And so, the people got married because they had to, and then they fooled around on the side in whichever way they wished, right? And he was basically claiming that homosexuality was troubling because it basically ruined marriages. So you have the two reasons of the, of the Roman Catholics' reproduction and the Protestants' messes of marriage. So 
You, but none of these really work because, of course, if we don't force gay people into marriages that are inappropriate for them, they won't wander. They're wandering, you might think, because they're being forced by the society to marry heterosexually. And if they weren't forced, then they could actually have real, emotionally real lives. They wouldn't be necessarily wandering from their, from their space. Now, this text, I, it, it's, it's, it's beautiful inside, but I, I want to say one other thing about it. Um, it's important when I do this work for me and for my community, that we are ready to be self-critiqued by the learning. In other words, it's, 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 it's lovely to learn a piece of Torah that, that, you know, that helps me, that supports the gay cause. But this is a text that actually also offers a bit of a critique. Because it could mean that gay male sexuality has a wandering element in it. And that, and, that, and that even outside of marriage with a woman, there's something wandering around about the way men construct their sex lives. Unless culture in, you know, encourages other structures of commitment and loyalty and longevity. And so I offer this as well, is to'e'a taba is both a way to describe why it just makes no sense to say the prohibition is about saving marriage, just stop making gay people marry the wrong gender. The other piece is, is that gay people need, we need to figure out how to employ our sexuality in ways that serve not only us, but the larger community that we are a part of. It is not only, now, the only way that happens is if we're welcomed back. In other words, we can say, everyone can say, the reason that I offer my love as a resource of commitment to the whole community is because I'm embraced by it. If you never accept my love relationship with my partner, right, then on some level you make me an outlaw, and then I don't actually get supported for staying loyal to him. So on some level, this is extremely important text for framing what is not wandering. How do you keep a marriage alive? You know, I'm learning that it's damn hard work. You have to work really hard to keep, and some people don't succeed and then they try again. But the point is, is that it's hard work to keep a marriage alive. And if you don't get cultural and familial and communal support, near impossible to make. Right? So that's why it's so important to understand. These texts are really rich because they're not only legitimating you know, gay, gay life, they're making us think about what has to be created to make it possible to live a decent Jewish life as a gay person. Okay. Gender confusion. This one emerged out of a text that um, I really found very interesting. I don't want to spend much time on this one because the last one is my most favorite and I want to uh, make sure that I get it. Um, this one suggests that sex between men is problematic because um, it confuses gender itself. Men are made to penetrate, women are made to be penetrated, and uh, when a man is penetrated by another man, it's like the milchic spoon in the fleshic plate, you know? And that means the milk and meat we separate, and if you mess it up, it's really confusing. And so the milk goes here, and the meat goes here. Men go here, and women go here. And it's like cross-dressing. Men dress like this, women dress like that. So could homosexuality be a problem of the Jewish love for categories, right? I mean, if you've never kept kosher, or you're with your grandmother who kept a kosher home, you don't know what it's like when you put the spoon that's milchic into the fleshic sink. The screams are blood curdling, right? So that's the thing. We are, we are a community that is aware of certain boundaries, and we like honoring them. And, and there's this sense, maybe sexuality is one of them. And so, could it be, 
Where's my? There it is. Could it be that the problem of homosexuality is like cross-dressing? So I don't want to spend too much time here except to say that um, this text from Ibn Ezra says, you know, a man was meant to do this and a woman that, and someone who confuses it confuses the creation, right? Here's what I want to suggest to you. Um, uh, 